There is a tummy warming feeling out there that says that Ukraine's invasion of the Kursk Oblast will rock Putin's legitimacy and his holdover power, putting Putin in trouble. Hello to Times Radio thumbnail makers. I like you. But that's premature for now. Putin's power ain't gonna be rocked as things stand. And we'll look at why, but we'll also look at what it would mean for his power to get rocked, how far this situation would need to escalate for us to get to that place. Since the 6th of August, Ukraine has done something unprecedented. It's taken Russian territory in a way that hasn't happened in history since 1941. The Russians have not been able to push Ukraine back and we've seen them pretending they have halted Ukraine's advance when they haven't. You even saw Mr. Gerasimov publicly lying in front of Mr. Putin about having stopped Ukraine's advance. Western analysts have pointed out that this is a humiliation for Putin because he brutally invaded Ukraine two and a half years ago and now he is losing control over Russian territory. And Western analysts are right, it is humiliating for Putin to lose control over Russian territory. But as Mark Galeotti has pointed out, being embarrassed and humiliated doesn't make Putin disappear. He'll just plod along. What would turn this into a more existential and not just a humiliating situation for Putin is if some of the following conditions get met as the situation unravels. The first of these conditions actually can't be met, but we'll look at why right now. And that requires us putting the Kursk invasion into the broader context of Putin's brutal full-scale invasion of Ukraine. If Putin had succeeded in taking Ukraine's capital in three days in February 2022, the West's response would have been much weaker than it has been, and the populist right in the West would have valorized Putin. The world's response to a successful coup slash takeover of Ukraine by Putin would have been to tell him if you do really, really bad things, but efficiently, you'll get away with it. But that's not what happened. Putin embarrassed himself repeatedly, nosedived his regime into existential turbulence that it did not necessarily have to survive. But at that point, the West couldn't put Putin into an existential situation because of its democratic incapacity at home. So that meant that the world told Putin if you do really bad stuff and do it bewilderingly incompetently, it won't pay that well for you, but the world won't make it existential for you either. And this happened for two reasons. The first is nuclear risk. The West was scared to make things existential for Putin in case Putin made things existential for the world. And secondly, democratic incapacity at home. The West was too polarized and too paralyzed at home to devise and implement a strategy for a Ukrainian victory against Putin's imperialist mania. So this is the context in which to see Putin losing territory to Ukraine nearly three years into the war. It's embarrassment number 17 of the war, but there could be 27 embarrassments that Putin survives. At least that's true at the level of the question of Western pressure making it existential for Putin. But there are other factors that could develop that create a rocky dynamic for Putin. Let's look at the next one. So the next one is Russian elites pushing Putin out. I got in trouble a year ago for saying on the radio that Mr. Prigozhin, when he marched on Moscow, created a revolutionary situation. I still stick with that assessment because what happened was that Prigozhin had a critique of the regime, but no positive program. If he had a positive program of reform addressed to different demographics and different institutions, from the security agencies to the army, he could have put the regime existentially on the rocks. The trouble was that Prigozhin's mutiny was something that happened to Prigozhin himself as much as it was something that happened to Putin. By the way, for more on uh, Prigozhin, take a look at Mark Galeotti and Anna Rutunyan's wonderful recent book. Now, Putin learned two lessons following the Prigozhin mutiny. The first lesson he learned is that his pre-war game of 
outsourcing power to different bits of his court, allowing them to conflict with each other about this, and then waltzing in as the monarch and arbitrating that conflict, that that dynamic no longer worked so well during a time of war. Because while Putin needed the conflict between Prigozhin and the Ministry of Defense to simmer away at a low level, it getting out of control was something he absolutely didn't want and he's learned that lesson now. The second lesson he's taken away is that he is now beginning to take steps and putting Belarusov into the Ministry of Defense is an important example of that, to coup-proof his regime with an eye on beginning to put it into the kind of shape he wanted to have come end game time. End game being when Putin's on the verge of losing power for biological or political reasons. So that's to say he's beginning to assemble a kind of human content in his regime that he would like to have when things get critical, which he hopes isn't going to happen for many years. And now let's say something about the top 100 most important powerful people in Putin's regime. Most of them probably are feeling fatigued and exasperated by Putin's imperial mania. But they all fall into one or more of the following three categories. They're either servants of Putin, they are beneficiaries of Putin's regime, or they are hostages in Putin. Regime. In other words, they're in a kind of submarine and they can't get off because if they did, not just their career, but their life would be at stake. And there is something more. These folks got there in virtue of a kind of negative selection, at least when it comes to moral properties. They're folks who are spectacularly more likely than other parts of the population to lack a moral spine. So elite turbulence that's existential for Putin looks away off. But how about a revolutionary situation that combines elite turbulence with down and up revolutionary momentum? Let's talk about what that would look like. In principle, that situation is entirely possible and may well take place. However, the preconditions for it are missing today. In the last video, we discussed a radically depoliticized Russian population. So let's formulate what it would take for them to act. To act, they would need to have a perception of an actionable alternative. And that, I think, requires three things. Number one, it requires a crack in the regime, the bit we've just discussed as possible but not on the cards today. It would need an opposition, doesn't have to be a democratic opposition, that is capable of politicizing the situation. And it would also need an opposition to offer an alternative vision for the country, preferably articulated by a leader. All three are missing in Russia today. At the moment, as Russian journalist Plushev put it the other day, the Russians are radically depoliticized and they're experiencing Ukraine's Kursk invasion, not as an invasion by an enemy, but as a natural disaster. Plushev says, neither the authorities nor the people as a whole perceive this as an invasion of the enemy, but rather as a natural disaster instead of people's war, partisan formations, you've got evacuation slash relocation, humanitarian aid and accommodation. And here's a fascinating sociological response to this. The question Plushev asks is reasonable. Why do we not see mass grassroots mobilization against Ukraine's incursion in the Kursk region? A hypothesis, the Russian people overall do not see Ukrainians as enemies. And here is my response. This is an interesting thought about why Russians treat Ukraine's incursion as a natural disaster and not a war, partly because they don't see Ukrainians as an enemy. And that, of course, is the case because Russians are in denial about the brutal war their regime in their name has unleashed on Ukraine. But if Russians got occupied by France, how far would they even see the French as an enemy? The thought here is that the Russian population is so deeply depoliticized that they see not just external powers, but their own government as a kind of external force. 
that they happen to be in a relationship of coexistence with. They feel themselves to be a population on a territory rather than citizens. Now we're in 2024 and the world is full of cultures dominated by a kind of uh, radical psychic individualism. So you might have lots of citizens in different places not protesting too much if the French took them over. But what I'm saying is there's a significant difference in degree when it comes to Russian depoliticization. And that's because their accommodation with the hypothetical French occupation may be in part a product of them half seeing their own government as a kind of colonial force. So these are the ways Putin goes down. But how does the Ukrainian invasion of the Kursk Oblast play into that? At the level of Western support, unless something extraordinarily escalatory happens, and there is a video viral on YouTube now of yep. the late Mr. Prigozhin speculating about a Kremlin tactical nuclear strike on Ukrainian troops inside Russian territory. Short of implausible scenarios, what we can anticipate is potentially a relaxation of the West's rules of engagement around weapons it gives to Ukraine. But the downward trajectory of Western support for Ukraine will continue and the major Western powers will continue to be on the lookout for a way to bring the war to a close in the near future. At the level of Russian elites, Ukraine's Kursk invasion, especially if it persists, is likely to accelerate the pattern we've already seen of intra-regime terror and repression. But that's a pattern that can always both stabilize and destabilize the regime. For the Russian population, Ukraine's Kursk invasion absolutely takes a chink out of Putin's aura of perceived legitimacy. But I want you to remember two things. Number one, because Putin is the only political institution in town with perceived legitimacy, Russians are inclined to blame everybody else but him for what is happening. Moreover, the agencies and institutions they do blame are agencies and institutions from which they have already terribly low expectations. The second thing I want you to bear in mind is if you're a Russian citizen who is radically depoliticized and is resisting looking at politics, your politics going even more badly isn't a reason to wake up. It might actually be a reason to avert your gaze and hide even more. But what if Putin is tempted into a significant wave of military mobilization, whatever form it takes? He'll probably be able to get away with one more as things stand. However, to go beyond that would require greater fascization of society. And a piece of analytical advice between you and I. Don't underestimate Putin's capacity to settle and get away with Ukraine controlling a bit of Russian territory for a long time. Eventually, people living on that Russian territory will have to face the question, what holds all of them together? And to understand what that's going to mean for them, we have to enter into a conversation about whether Russia will maintain its integrity or whether it could break up. And to understand that really important debate, watch this video next.